Good evening and welcome to MLA's Sheep Productivity and Profitability webinar series. My name is David Brown and I work for the webinar coordinators, Homesacker. The title of tonight's webinar is Grains Outlook for the 17-18 Summer and Autumn to Assist Supplementary Feeding Decisions. Tonight's presenter is going to be Richard Perkins of Market Check and we're looking forward to hearing from him tonight. Just before I proceed, I would advise everyone that we have another webinar next week on Wednesday evening. It's going to be Wednesday the 25th of October. And that webinar has been presented by Jeff Duddy of Sheep Solutions. And Jeff's going to be focusing on whether or not feeding prime lambs over this coming summer is going to be economically feasible in light of a failing spring and and uncertain grain prices. So keep an eye out for information coming up about that webinar, uh, Wednesday the 25th of November, uh, sorry, October, that's next week. This control panel is gonna be in the right hand, uh, cor top right hand corner of your screen. That red arrow button left on the left collapses and reinstates the control panel. Uh, you should be able to hear us, but we can't hear you. And that box there, the questions box, is an important part of this evening. That's where everyone uh, pops in their comments and questions for us to deal with at the end of the webinar. And you're welcome to write something in there now if you wish. Let us know what the weather's doing in your part of the world. Um, say hello and that lets us know that you know where the box is and also that you can hear me. So tonight's presenter is Richard Perkins. Uh, Richard heads up the advisory and marketing divisions at MarketCheck. And with over 12 years of experience in domestic and international grain markets, he's very well resourced and experienced to provide livestock producers some insight into what they could expect to have to pay for supplementary feed uh, for their uh, sheep flocks over this summer and autumn. And also an insight into when they may be looking to uh, buy into those grain stocks as well. So I'd like to introduce Richard to the webinar. Just give one second here and I'll pass over the, uh, the webinar to Richard. <coughs> How are you going there, Richard? Yeah, well, thanks. It's a story. So welcome to the webinar. Um, everyone's looking forward to hearing from you and you should be able to share your screen with us anytime soon. Right. Everyone can see that now? See that, Dave? Perfect. Yep, I can see your agenda and um, we'll catch up at 8 o'clock. Uh, sorry, 8.30. Great. Okay, I'll, I'll get into it. Um, now, I haven't done many webinars in the past. Uh, I'm normally used to the live crowd, but uh, I'll try not to rip through it too quickly. Um, but yeah, look, look forward to some questions at the end. I'll quickly run through the agenda. I'll, I'm just going to give everyone a bit of a, a high level view of what's happening in the grain markets. Uh, you know, a slide on what's happening globally, a slide, a couple of slides on what's happening domestically, uh, which will dovetail into the structure of the domestic market. And then I'll sum it up with where I think feed grain prices are going. Uh, and then some tipping points that really need to be uh, kept in the back of your minds as we go into the harvest. And then just wrap it up at the end. <clears throat> as an introduction, I'd just like everyone to keep in mind some points. And as I go through the slides, uh, I'll be supporting these points with evidence. So first of all, Australia, Australian grain prices are very expensive globally. Now, when I've, I've got in their basis, so what we call basis is the difference between our cash price and a relative futures price. But essentially what we're saying is, is if basis is high, Australian grain prices are very, very high versus the global benchmark. Uh, and if it's, if it's cheap basis, we're relatively cheap versus the global benchmark. And at the moment, Australian wheat, barley, oats, corn, everything is very expensive compared to the rest of the world. Harvest prices, in our view, will are and will continue to come under pressure and soften as we get into harvest. Weather will be a key driver of, of domestic markets, particularly on the East Coast. Uh, and the southern, the south will feed the north. Essentially, 
Victoria and Southern New South Wales will have to feed uh, the strong demand, uh, particularly from the cattle markets up in Southern Queensland. So keep that in mind and I'll jump straight into it, starting with the grain market update. <clears throat> this is just global wheat stocks now. It's, it, it's a lot in the chart, but really what I'm trying to ram home is the gray line on the right hand side is stocks to use. Now stocks to use is basically global supply of wheat, less global demand. So that leaves stocks, which is the green bar, and it's stocks as a percentage of the demand. So essentially the higher the percentage, the more bearish prices are. And as you can see, it's been ratcheting higher and higher and higher and higher and higher. So globally, crops are getting bigger and bigger and bigger and bigger and bigger, but demand hasn't been able to keep up with it. So we've got more and more stocks left over at the end of each season. And as a result, global wheat prices are very, very weak. Looking at global corn, same chart, but as you can see, uh, stocks are a fair bit tighter. The stocks to use is sub 20%. So the stocks as a percentage of total demand is sub 20%. Wheat is over 35%. So as you can see, corn, which is essentially the global benchmark for feed grain, because that is the biggest crop globally, uh, is, is a fair bit tighter. So a bit more supportive of price than wheat. Barley. So now we're into you know, feed grains that are a bit more relevant to Australia. Uh, globally, uh, barley stocks are, are probably getting to be the tightest since nearly 1990. Um, there's been smaller crops, obviously in Australia, but also the Ukraine, in Argentina, in the EU, um, and demand has been increasing, particularly in Saudi, uh, but also in China. Uh, there's been massive demand from China, particularly in the last three years. So as a result, crops are getting smaller, but demand is growing and stocks are slowly dwindling. So this is supportive of global barley prices. Global oats, again, um, relatively tight globally, but you know, oats as a percentage of global feed grains is a very, very small percent. Um, so largely irrelevant for, for today's um, presentation. So really what we're gonna concentrate on is, in Australia is wheat and barley. So looking a bit more closer to home, uh, on the left, we have Australian wheat stocks. Again, similar chart to the global stocks, but it's in Australia. So it's all the wheat we produce, um, take away everything that's used, so total demand. It is remaining stocks. <clears throat> so as you can see, ending stocks is the gray bar, which is the smallest bar, and it is relatively low compared to the last you know, 10, 15 years. The green dotted line shows the stocks to use. So again, Stocks to use percentage in Australia is less than 10%, which is extremely low. What I'd also like to point out is the 2016-17 production was an all-time record. I think most are aware for wheat, up near 35 million tonnes. But the market did a really good job of clearing the decks, as we call it. So you know, prices were at a level where we exported quite a lot. We also had growing feed demand domestically. Uh, so there's a lot sold, which which reduced our stocks. Barley, bit of a different story. It's been tight for a few years now. Now the main reason for this is China. Um, our, our price for barley land into China uh, has been between $150 and $200 a tonne cheaper than what those very strong southern markets in China can buy their own domestic corners. So as a result, we've seen a lot more barley going out the door and over to China. Um, but you know, this barley is more so coming from South Australia and WA. Barley on the East Coast, you know, some goes in containers, there are a few vessels out of Victoria, but by and large, barley on the East Coast feeds our own domestic market. But as you can see, stocks to use less than 5%, quite tight. So what does this mean? <clears throat> What we're looking at here is basis, wheat basis, as I said, basis is just our relative strength compared to a global benchmark. In this instance, it's US wheat. But what I, what I wanna point out here is if we start at the left-hand side of the chart, we've got the three major ports being Brisbane, Port Adelaide, and Quinana. 
And I just want to give you an idea of what's happened over the season. But essentially, we started in January you know, at zero. And as we've gone through the season, we've exported a lot, we've sold a lot. It's gotten drier on the East Coast. Our crop's gone backwards. We're looking forward to next year and realise we probably don't have enough wheat. So our price has just strengthened against the global benchmark. Uh, and here we are in September and the yellow line at the top is Brisbane, no surprise. Um, it has by far the largest domestic demand of any state and it has by far the smallest production. Um, so every year that, that state is very tight and hence why prices compared to the global benchmarks, it keeps increasing because the job of that market is to destroy offshore demand to keep it in Australia to feed the cattle and feed the chickens. Um, the blue line is Quinana, so Perth, and the green line is Port Adelaide. So now we'll look at the domestic market structure. And I'll just start with, as I alluded to earlier, uh, last year we had record production, not only for wheat, but for barley. I just wanted to give you some insight into where that crop goes. Um, the green line um, are this year's exports of barley. The, the, the gray bar is last year's production, which was nearly 12 million tonnes. So as you can see, uh, exports uh, were the big, were the big um, taker of last year's barley crop. The last record export record year we had was 2013 and 14 in the orange line. So we've blown that out of the water. Um, where did it go to? <clears throat> well, as you can see now, the red line are exports to China. So it makes up well over 60% of all barley exports out of Australia now. Um, the 10 year average barley exports to China is more like 1.6, 1.5, 1.6. Um, so in the last three or four years, you know, as I said, exports to China have grown rapidly, which has seen, sometimes seen barley prices overtaking wheat. Um, and that could potentially happen over the next six months. Wheat, strong export year. Um, the last record set in 2011 and 12 wasn't beaten, but we're pretty close to. So, you know, 35 million tonne wheat crop, we, we're probably going to export around 23 million tonnes of wheat. Enough on the export side of things. Domestically, um, this is feed grain consumption for this season. So, when we call what we call a season is the 1st of October through to the 31st of September. Um, every year, uh, that is Australia's marketing year. So I just wanted to point out that that green dotted line is, is total feed grain consumption in Australia since 2010. As you can see, it's grown quite rapidly. Um, splitting the increase over the last uh, sort of five years out, we've seen a 24% increase um, from the poultry sector for feed grain. We've seen a 2% increase from the pork sector a 38% increase in cattle and a small decline in dairy. Now, I don't have the sheep on here. I, I couldn't get it um, in time, but these numbers have come from the, rel you know, the relevant governing bodies or the industry leaders. Now, as I said, the East Coast market um, is where the issues lie. Now, the West Coast can't really help us. South Australia is a long way uh, from Queensland, which is where the biggest hole is in terms of you know, domestic demand. <clears throat> I just want to give you a picture of um, the East Coast stocks of feed grain. So when I say East Coast, I say mean Victoria, New South Wales and Queensland combined. When I say feed grain, I mean wheat, barley and sorghum. Uh, now oats, we don't grow much on the East Coast, majority is grown in the West. Um, there are some favours, some lentils, um, you know, different other smaller grains that you can feed, but I'm going to talk about the main ones because they will drive the rest, particularly wheat. Wheat will drive barley um, and barley will drive those smaller grains. So as you can see, 2016-17, big crop, but demand was also very strong. <clears throat> so stocks were small as we moved into this marketing year. Combined with a lot of dryness, uh, particularly in New South Wales and Queensland, led to a much smaller crop, which means going into this harvest, the crop's going to be much smaller. We're going to draw down last year's stocks that were carried over. Um, 
But the domestic demand on the East Coast is very inelastic. We can't just you know, start shooting animals and say, okay, it's too expensive. Um, so cattle, cattle need to be fed, particularly on the downs, and that market's huge. Um, so the job of the East Coast market is to destroy that export demand to keep the grain um, in, in the country. I just wanted to highlight um, the different states within the East Coast and the, the difference between what they, what they produce and what they use, essentially the exportable surplus or deficits in each state. Now, I mean, the ones really to look, the one really to look at is Queensland, it's the red one. So more times than not, they are in a deficit. Um, you know, every year they really only produce about a million tonnes of wheat and a couple hundred thousand tonnes of barley. The blue line is New South Wales. Their ending stocks or their surplus is by far the greatest of the three states. And then Victoria more times than not has some small carryover. Now this is again, wheat, barley, sorghum combined. So on average, New South Wales feeds Victoria and feeds Queensland. This year is a bit different. <clears throat> We've actually got New South Wales feeding Queensland, but because it's so dry in Northern New South Wales and Queensland, we've actually got Victoria feeding New South Wales and Queensland as well. Uh, and I'll highlight that <clears throat> with some spreads. But essentially, on the left-hand side here, you've got a map of last year, last year's price action. And when I mean price action, I mean the bids under the Darling Downs or into Brisbane got to a level where it was drawing enough grain, so it was paying for enough freight to drag grain from you know, just south of Moray because the crop was big and right up on the border, it was big in Queensland. They didn't need to bid up to drag grain, you know, much further south than Moree or Bladder or Narrabri. This year is a completely different case. <clears throat> that whole northern New South Wales region, uh, the crop is much smaller. Uh, the Queensland crop is, is down, you know, at least 60, 70%. Uh, up until about two or three weeks ago, no one really thought we'd have a sorghum crop. You know, that downs mark relies on substituting some of their feed rations with cheaper sorghum in, in April and May. Um, so about three or four weeks ago, the drawing arc was reaching into as far as South Australia. So the Brisbane bid for wheat compared to the Adelaide bid got to about $100 a tonne over, or pretty close to. That buys you a fair bit of freight right across the East Coast. So the point I'm trying to make is that the whole market shifted compared to last year. And if you are an end user in Southern East of Wales or Victoria, you are competing against um, the cattle feedlots up on the Darling Downs. <clears throat> Just in the last two weeks, three weeks, we've had a fair bit of rain, particularly in Northern New South Wales and Queensland. Now, this chart here shows the spread between the Brisbane wheat market and the Port Kembla wheat market. Now, Port Kembla is essentially Southern New South Wales Riverina. That, that's the zone. So it basically gives us a bit of insight into how far south that Queensland market is drawing grain from. So as you can see, at the end of September, it reached its highest and it was getting up around $50 a tonne. Um, now that pays for a lot of, lot of freight, whether it's by rail or by road, to drag grain from, you know, Hillston or Condo or wherever it may be, um, all the way up into the Darling Downs. But like I said, the market is very sensitive to weather. So a bit of rain came over the last two or three weeks. The whole trade is now pretty confident that we will get a decent sorghum plant. So, you know, everyone's plugging in maybe two million tonnes of sorghum. Half a million tonne goes out the door to China every year for the liquor industry. That means it's one, 1 1.5 million tonnes of sorghum that the cattle guys can can switch rations into to help, you know, help alleviate costs and not have to drag grain from all the way across the state. So that's why I've said that's seen that spread come in a bit, um, which is good if you're an end user in Southern New South Wales or Victoria, because you're no longer competing um, so much against the, those feedlots up under the Darling Downs. So where to for feed grain prices? I thought I'd run through sort of where to buy um, what to buy and when to buy. Um, and as I run through it, if you've got any questions, you can jot them down I think on the right hand side of your screen. And then I'll just finish off with some tipping points, things we need to watch out for that could really tip this market either you know, down or up. So where is a good place to buy? I mean, 
if you're if you're on the east coast, Victoria is probably the cheap, or definitely is the cheapest port zone. Um, now this is a bit of a convoluted chart if you've never looked at grain pricing charts before, but um, what I want you to look at is the red line down the bottom, and that is essentially the Victorian wheat price compared to Chicago wheat, which is the global benchmark for wheat. Um, and although it has been going from strength to strength, we have seen it start to, if you look on the right hand side of the chart, start to taper off. And I haven't up updated this chart for a few days, but the bids are really starting to fall away. Um, so I think that, you know, if you're looking to buy any sort of feed grain, Victoria is a good place to start. The other reason is the Victorian price for wheat and barley is around $35 to $40 a tonne under the Kembla price. So that's, you know, as the crow flies, you know, you can, between different sites, whether it's a Melbourne or a Port Kembla site, it's 40, 50 kilometres. Um, so again, Port Kembla, Southern New South Wales, um, and then you've got Geelong or Melbourne, it's Victoria. The spread, traditionally, Southern New South Wales feeds Victoria. This year, it's the reverse. The New South Wales price is at 35 to $40 a tonne over Victoria. And then Queensland is, you know, another 20 to 30 dollars a ton over New South Wales. So it's getting up around 70, 60, 70 dollars a ton over Victoria. So where to buy? Vic, good place to start because you know we're already talking to growers, a lot of our clients in Victoria, they're not too, too happy with the prices in Victoria. So um, in terms of you know buying the cheapest uh, region or the cheapest grain, Victoria is the place to start. When to buy? <clears throat> so get another basis chart. You're going to be sick of these by the end, but this 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 is very important chart. This is essentially the Port Kembla APW price, so the wheat price, compared to the US price six year average. So, what what this what this gives us, or what this illustrates, is when when are Australian prices at their weakest point compared to the rest of the world? And on, over the six last six years, on average the best time to buy wheat in Australia has been at harvest. And it's no surprise, as you can see, the dip between December and January um, is, is pretty evident um, that it is the best time to buy. And the reason for that is because of harvest pressure. You know, particularly in years like this, where you've got high cash prices, a lot of growers look at our price compared to the rest of the world. And they don't care whether it's, you know, we're expensive or whether we're very, very cheap for the rest of the world. The cash price is high, they'll typically sell a larger percentage of their grain at harvest, which is why you see the harvest pressure kick in, um, uh, particularly as we get into December and into January. Um, and then on average, um, our price relative to the global benchmark, which is Chicago wheat, um, strengthens. So as you can see, it just goes from strength to strength as we get through the year. And there's a number of reasons this happens, but you know, Australia being very much a weather-driven market, um, if it gets dry or there's a bit of scepticism around the size of next year's crop, as you get into Feb, March, April, a lot of farmers decide, okay, I don't really want to sell until I'm sure of my next crop. And then selling really dries up. It's very hard to buy grain, particularly from GM through to April. Um, and our, and, you know, our price just rallies higher and higher and higher versus the global benchmark. Basis rallies is what we call it in our industry. What to buy? As I said at the start of the presentation, I'm going to concentrate on ASW and F1. Although we have run an oats pool this year, and I mean, oats are super cheap. I mean, you look in Victoria, Victoria, which is the cheapest. So Victorian wheat prices, you know, X farm, um, just, just to give you a bit of an idea, I'll take that off in case it confuses you. But, you know, Victorian wheat prices are around 264. Now they're back around 220, 230x farm. Um, barley's 30 bucks, 20, 30 bucks under that. Oats would be like 150 farm, 140 farm. So oats are pretty cheap. But as I said, the two biggest grains in Australia would dictate where the rest of the market goes. So if we're looking at ASW and F1, which is essentially in Australia, we don't really grow feed wheat. ASW is our feed wheat, um, unless we get a wet harvest. So the ASWF1 spread is one we watch quite closely, and the black line is what's been what's been happening this year. So it never really gets much more than fifty. Anytime it gets to fifty dollars under AS, it just bounces up. People want to own it, 
um, it works into rations, whether it's the dairy industry, the, the pork industry, chickens, cattle. Barley, from a domestic perspective, never gets really any more cheaper than $50 a ton under ASW. Currently, it's around 20, 25. Um, but really, that's on the back of you know China buying so much barley this year. And I really don't think that's going to disappear. And, and I can talk about what's happening in China and why I don't think, don't think it's going to disappear. For hours, that's a completely different presentation. But our view is um, on the back of uh, shrinking stocks in China, um, smaller competition for Australian barley out of Ukraine and, 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 and the US. Our view is that barley prices will remain fairly strong. I mean, there's no reason they can't go to the same price as wheat. Um, so if you want to know what to buy, uh, depending on, you know, and you would know this, you probably have to talk to your nutritionists. Um, barley's still pretty good value at 25 to 30 under ASW. Um, but again, you know, we're still relatively um, bearish wheat prices versus the global benchmark or wheat prices. We're getting to harvest, which should put pressure on barley, but because the barley crop's so much smaller, it probably won't be pressured as much as wheat. Um, but as we, as we get out of harvest, as I showed you in the earlier chart, basis strengthens more times than not, wheat prices strengthen more times than not. Um, and growers who don't sell at harvest, if, if they're, really, they're gonna sit on it, they're gonna bury it, they're gonna put it in the storage and they're not gonna to wanna to talk about it for a few months. So harvest is either, you know, the next few weeks or at harvest is the time to be buying either the AS or a bit of an F1 as well. Tipping points <clears throat> on the left-hand side, we're gonna talk about what's the bullish tipping points, or the bullish tipping, yeah. What's bullish prices? A, a smaller sorghum crop is bullish prices. As I said, if, if we don't get that 1.52 million tonne sorghum crop, if things start turning really uh, dry and nasty over the next few months, um, those feedlots, that strong demand up in Queensland, and the strong demand in Newcastle and across the Liverpool Plains too, they won't get, um, they won't get a crack at that, that alternative grain to, to supplement their feed rations. Um, so a smaller crop, you know, is bullish prices uh, long-term. Chinese demand, if China keeps buying our barley, which we think they will, it's gonna keep F1 barley, feed barley prices well supported. Um, next year, so red crop, as we get into February, March, if the outlook for next year's crop doesn't look so promising, things will just start ratcheting higher. Um, system stock, um, how do I explain this one? So if, if farmers are putting more grain into the system uh, for any reason, whether they're moving away from silo bags or, or they need to get it off quick and get it into the system or there's better bids being paid in the system, it's gonna be pretty bullish prices because to pull it out of the system, it's much more expensive than buying X farm grain. So if there's a lot of high quality grain around, it will likely go into the system. What is bearish prices? Uh, conversely to the first point, if we get a larger sorghum crop, it will put pressure on the Northern markets, which will ease the competition down in the Southern regions. If we get a wet harvest, it will definitely put pressure on feed wheat and feed barley prices because we'll have a much larger portion of feed wheat around. Um, there'll be smaller demand from the millers, there'll be smaller demand from the exporters. Uh, and as a result, feed grain prices will be under pressure. Stronger AUD, tough one to hedge if you're a domestic consumer. Um, but if it's, if it's softer, uh, you know, domestic prices will increase. Um, Conversely, if it's, sorry, yeah, if it's weaker, domestic prices will increase. If it's stronger, um, prices will soften. And we are uh, short-term bullish, the Aussie dollar, which should keep prices relatively uh, <clears throat> wrapped up on the East Coast. And on-farm storage, if there's a lot more grain, particularly if we have a wet harvest that goes on-farm, it's, it's a fair bit cheaper to buy than if you have to drag it out of the system because you don't have your $14, $15 a tonne in and out costs going into the system. And when I say system, I mean a grain corp side or a private side. So just to conclude the presentation, I just wanted to reinforce some points that I hope I, I supported well enough through the presentation. 
First of all, harvest grain prices will come under pressure. They've already come off around $25, $30 a tonne in the last few weeks, and we think they will remain under pressure. There's a fair bit of growers selling out there, but just by and large, high cash prices, once growers get enough off, that we're more willing to, to chip in to the, um, into the market. But then again, we're still gonna have a lot of exporters and a lot of millers uh, that need to cover a lot of grain. Basis, so wheat um, and barley prices post-harvest, relative to the global benchmark market, should rally. Our view is they will. Um, we are still very, very tight of stocks. Once the harvest pressure subsides, we should see a recovery in price across the East Coast post-harvest. Markets will remain very, very sensitive to weather. So whether it's just an outlook, you know, the, the market really does trade outlooks now. Whether it's rained or not, they'll just keep trading outlooks. Um, so very something to stay on top of, you know, looking at the forecasts. And now our view is really to have demand covered by the end of harvest, absolutely. I mean, that's that's I I'm, I'm pretty sure that's what you're after, and that is our view that you know you could probably start getting cover on immediately, but have it all covered by the end of harvest because once harvest subsides, our view is these markets will just continue to rally post harvest. And I think, yeah, that is about it. Um, I will hand back over to Dave and there might be a couple of questions. Great. Thank you very much, Richard. That was an um, excellent presentation. And um, on behalf of Emily and the audience, thank you very much for, for passing over that um, knowledge and experience that you got there. I don't think we could have got a, a better insight into the grains market uh, this coming summer and autumn and um, and also the rationale behind it so that should things or current situations change uh, then people can you know take on board that um, those, those things that are driving the market and, and make and make their own decisions based on that but look I'm just going to give you a break there for a second uh, to catch your breath and yep. and um, we will be catching everyone up next week on the 25th, uh, 25th of October with a webinar looking at, you know, whether it's going to be you know, profitable or, or, or economically feasible to uh, finish uh, unfinished prime lambs over the summer, um, given given probably a, a short spring in a lot of areas and a lot of trade stock floating around is, is definitely going to be on everyone's lips. And I think tonight's webinar is a great lead into to next week's webinar with Jeff Duddy. Um, understanding what grain prices are going to do over the uh, next uh, four months will play a big role in that decision and whether or not people are going to take on uh, take their unfinished lambs on over the Christmas and, and, uh, and late summer, early autumn period to finish them off and, and hopefully snare a, a reasonable market uh, early in 2018. So keep an eye for emails and text messages about that coming up. That's next week, uh, Wednesday, the 25th of October. Now, don't forget that after you're finished tonight, um, there's going to be a, a webinar survey pop up. I appreciate if everyone quickly whips through that and leave their thoughts, positive or constructive, uh, uh, any constructive criticism. And we take it on board and helps us navigate our way through the webinar series to make sure that we deliver the value that we set out to do. Now, you're welcome to stay on for the question and answer period now. Richard's kindly off to stay on for as long as we need to answer a few questions. Uh, otherwise, you're more than welcome to um, uh, to sign off and, and go on with your evening. Now, there is, uh, oh, one other thing I was gonna say, please, if you've got friends or family that aren't au okay with the webinar series, you know, this is a MLA funded initiative and it is going through to the end of this financial year. So, in, we want to make sure that as many MLA levy payers have access to this information as possible. So please let your friends, family, co-workers know about it. Um, if you want, direct them through to me. Um, I'll get them the registration link. Uh, otherwise, um, you're more than welcome to send on uh, the registration link that you would have received at some stage in the past. Now, question-wise, the, there's a few questions coming in here, which is good to see. Um, you're welcome to start drotting your questions in for Richard in the questions box and sending them through. 
it's not often you get a person with um, uh, with knowledge in this area uh, available to answer questions for you so to encourage you to take advantage of that and um, start sending them through but there's a good question here to lead with Richard if um, if you want to apologize uh, I got you there Richard there's yes, a question. Can you hear me okay? yeah I got you now um, there's a question here um, from uh, Matt Matt's over in South Australia big shout out to the South Australian crowd um, now Richard this may be within your in your area of um, uh, area of knowledge but Matthew wants to know a bit about lupin prices in South Australia and what we're looking what we're looking at happening over the summer and autumn period <laughs> I don't know a lot about lupins I'm really sorry Matt We've got a guy who specialises in lupins in our office. I probably should have got a bit more information from him. Um, there, are, All I do know is there's a huge crop coming at us of lupins. We got actually asked to open a lupin pool um, in South Australia um, a few weeks ago, which I don't know, we've, we've never really traded them. It's very much a cash crop. There's no hedging tool for lupins but all I know is there's a big crop um, in Victoria and in South Australia and I don't think growers are going to sell any at harvest that's sort of the feeling I'm getting that they're, they're more keen to sell wheat than barley or wheat and canola and then probably hold their lupins um, in terms of price where I think prices are going to I couldn't really answer that all I know is there's a big crop coming growers aren't loving the price um, and they're probably more keen to store and hold Awesome, thank you, Richard. Uh, question here from from Harry. Harry asks, uh, should growers in southern New South Wales be looking to grow feed corn now, given water allocations um, and sh and shortages, high prices of feed of feed grains? Yeah, definitely. I mean, feed corn is another niche market. I think not only in Australia, but particularly in the US. And, and all around the world, probably except for Russia. A lot of farmers are looking to switch into specialty crops because the margins are much better. Um, you know, this year is a bit of an anomaly in Australia, but it's because we've got a much smaller crop where you've got wheat prices quite high. But all around the world, uh, wheat, barley prices are very, very soft and, and farmers are looking to switch into uh, more niche crops. And, and I definitely think corn's a good one. Um, you know, not only do we have strong domestic demand for corn, and a small crop, we've got strong export demand for it too. So, um, yeah, look, I think corn's a good option. Richard, I might take the uh, take the liberty of asking a quick question of you. Now, I I understand that if there's a very wet harvest, uh, I suspect that will will create a lot of um, or drop the quality on a lot of grain. Um, on the uh, on the other side of the equation, if we if there is a lot of areas with um, say grain heads that don't fill is that where we increase the screenings and if there's uh, increased screenings will that sort of increase the amount of grain um, that will be coming under the feed market or, or is that not the case yeah it, it depends on the protein countries like Vietnam and Thailand thrive on high protein high screenings or what we call HBS because they normally like to buy it at a discount, yet they love the protein. So if you're getting 14, 15% wheat, which I know is coming off around Balladur and Moree at this stage, even barley 15%, um, as long as the screenings are sub 15, sub 20%, the box market will still want to eat that up. Um, and so far, the feed market is still a 70, 10 market. So I mean, min 70 test weight, max 10% screening. So. If we do get high protein, high screenings, there's still going to be competition offshore for it. I don't think it's going to go into the feed market. Well, some will up in the north, um, but the, the containerized export market will really want to take a lot of that stuff offshore. Oh, great. Thank you. That, well, that makes sense. Um, that's a question that I've had in my mind for a while. Um, now, a question here from Neil. Neil asks, what happens if we have a failed season next year? Uh, that's the... 2018, 19 halves. What will prices do then, do you think? <laughs> well, we're off to the races, really. Uh, if we have another bad year, um, look, I'll give you a bit of an insight into what could happen next year. It happened about a month, six weeks ago. Um, there was no rain on the forecast. 
Some areas in New South Wales had come off one of their driest winters ever and a pretty dry sowing period. And you know, we look at basis, which is our price relative to the global market, because we still need to price some exports. Um, but the East Coast market just kept going up and up and up and up. I mean, Brisbane got up to sort of 370, 380 a tonne. I've seen Brisbane at 500 bucks a tonne, but the difference back when that was 500 bucks a tonne was that the global prices were much higher. We've got this market now where you've got very, very low global prices and very, very high Australian prices to the point where we've, you know, I suppose it'll get to the point where there's a bidding war between the millers in Southeast Asia and the domestic consumers who wants it more. Um, and my view is that there is still pretty strong inelastic demand from Southeast Asia, upwards of 10, 11 million tonnes. So I think, you know, prices could get up to, even though global prices are quite low for wheat, prices could still get, you know, up to those $400 plus numbers quite easily if we have a bad crop next year. And that's, we're talking about that in our office right now. Like, okay, we've sort of got a handle on what this year is going to be like. What about next year? Um, and it's, if we have another bad year, it's quite scary. Yeah, right. Yeah, that's very interesting. At what stage, um, Richard, does, um, is there a stage when grain starts flowing back into Australia if the, if the uh, basis or the, the difference between the, uh, uh, the two get too high? Yeah, well, that's, that's where we got to six weeks ago. We got to import parity. We started with it. Brisbane hit import parity. So when I say that, it is, is it the price where they can import grain? And, you know, we, we, we could import grain from the UK or Russia you know, right now and you could make 20, 30 bucks a tonne, but it's, it's, it's extremely hard. We've got very strict biosecurity rules around importing grain from other countries. So that just won't happen. So the first place it will come from is South Australia. And six weeks ago, the spread between Brisbane and Adelaide got to nearly $100 a tonne. So it was very close, you know, within five or 10 bucks of working to put grain on a boat in South Australia, wheel it up to Brisbane, dump it into a port, and then feed that metro market, maybe even take a few trucks back up country to the downs. So that's what will happen. It'll get to a price where South Australian farmers are happy to sell it into an exporter and they'll take it around up into Brisbane. If the South Australian crop's too small, or they have a bad year, then it'll come from WA. If the WA crop's too bad, then there was a period about 10 years ago where I think it was 06, 07 drought, where we, we took one or two boats from the UK into Brisbane. So that's where it might get to. Yeah, wow, well, okay, thank you. Um, Richard, a question here from Dan. Now, I know Dan's up, he's sort of upper, upper southern tablelands. Uh, Dan asks, how many tonnes of feed grain is still out there, stored underground on farm in all the states? Yeah, that's a great question. We actually had a farmer at a seminar two weeks ago say to us, um, what about all the grain that's still out in the farm? And we said, well, it depends on who you talk to. You talk to exporters and their view is that there's, there's not much because they've been bidding prices to a level where if the grower's not going to sell it, then they don't have it. Then you talk to farmers and there's, there's, a, there's, there's a bit above ground, there's a lot below ground, mostly barley. Um, and I, talking to some farmers, price is largely irrelevant. Um, it's there, you know, some are going to want 300, 350. The numbers vary. How much is out there? How much stock is out there across the East Coast? Um, you combine wheat and barley together. You know, some people are calling carry out in, I mean, you said, all the carryout is going to be in New South Wales and Victoria. Some people are calling the carryout 5 million tonnes. Some are calling it 2 million tonnes. Where in our office, we're saying it's probably two sub two New South Wales, Vic combined. It's, it's extremely tight, but it rarely gets much tighter than that. Um, again, because it's just stuck in the pipeline. It's very hard to get access to. And, you know, when you've got farmers in northern North New South Wales who don't have a crop, they're just going to sit on it until this time, maybe even next year. Um, so yeah, it, it, that's the million dollar question. How much carryover stock is there? That will dictate what prices do post harvest next year. But I wouldn't want to run the risk of seeing where prices get to. I'd, I'd rather get my coverage on before the end of harvest. All right, yeah, well, thank you. Okay. Uh, now, Richard, is your knowledge of the Tasmanian market uh, there? Because we have a question here from Helen. Uh, is there any information on Tasmanian prices especially oats and wheat? 
Well, I don't know the Tasmanian market very well, but I do know it's mostly imported in container, yeah, bought in containers from Melbourne or yeah, shipped across. Um, so I, I can't answer that, but I, I do know that the Victorian wheat prices will dictate what happens in Tasmania. And the Victorian market is the cheapest in Australia at the moment. So, you know, it's, it's a good thing if you're a buyer in Tasmania. Yeah, whatever. Thank you. Now, Richard, here's a, um, here's a question in the, uh, from Ross. Ross asks, in the, if the inland rail system ever gets built, would you expect to see more movement of all the grains from the south to the north or perhaps an increase in numbers of cattle on feed in newly developed lots in southern New South Wales and Victoria? Well, if the inland rail gets up and running, they won't need to be on feedlot. I don't think in southern South Wales and Victoria because the, the, the rate should be a fair bit cheaper to get it from south to north. Um, but that's, yeah, we talk a bit about that in the office. It will definitely make inland freight much, much cheaper and it will solve a few of those issues we have of getting grain from the south to the north. Um, yeah, I don't think there's going to be an increase in, in demand in southern New South Wales and Victoria. I think it solves a lot of those issues of getting grain to the northern markets, which need it most. Yeah, thank you. I hope that answers it. Yeah, yeah no, it's a, uh, it's, a, uh, it's, a, it's a question that's uh, it's need a bit of a uh, long way in the future, maybe. Now, mm. uh, this might be our last question, Richard. Uh, if anybody else has got more questions, um, you're welcome to bang them down, put pen to paper and send them in. Um, likewise, if you've got questions that you come up with after the webinar, you're welcome to send them to either me or Richard. Um, yeah, you can send them the market check email there or send them to me. I'll make sure they get through to Richard and we're going to answer for you. Um, Richard, one last question here from Jim. Now, Jim, Jim asks, how do you store grain below ground? Um, have you got any ideas on that? Well, what was the question? How? Yes. How to store grain above and below ground? No, just below ground. So um, below. Yeah, I'm, I'm not the person to ask how to, how to bury grain. I've seen videos of it. Uh, that's about it. Um, from what I understand, they dig big holes, put tarps down. Um, there's got to be an element of treating it correctly. I don't know what you would treat it with. Um, but yeah, look, I'm not the person to ask about correct yeah. underground storage methods. I'm sorry. Yeah, no dramas. No, and Jim, there's, um, I can't think of them off the top of my head, but maybe New South Wales Grain Growers or uh, the GRDC, they're definitely organisations that will be able to help you um, at least find the, um, get access to those sort of skills and knowledge to, uh, to, to get that underway. Uh, there has been a, a late question coming here for you, Richard, from Ross. Um, Ross asks, what would it take to drop the local wheat price uh, what would it take to drop the local wheat price for it to approach parity with export prices? He's in, and Ross is in uh, New South Wales. Yep, so export prices right now, I mean, we're not really exporting much. I mean, yeah, we're exporting bits and pieces. The Southeast Asian consumers are getting quite um, smart about how they buy. They're just going to wait till harvest because they know, and as I alluded to in my presentation, that the cheapest grain to buy is at harvest and they'll buy three, four, five, six months out the curve at harvest when they can buy it. They're not going to bid up for it now. Although prices, as I said, have come down 20, 30, $25, $30 a tonne in the last few weeks on the back of all the rain. And there's a lot of growers coming out of the woodwork and selling a bit. Um, so we are, we are pretty much export parity in Victoria, South Australia and WA. You know, we're not going to sell a million tonnes at these prices, but there are containers and a couple of vessels being sold um, out of Victoria, South South Australia and WA. Port Kembla, completely different story, or New South Wales. You've got Western Milling, Allied Milling and Manildra Milling, all bidding for APWH2 wheat. Um, they need quality wheat, so they're all bidding for it, which is, and you've also got some exporters in Kembla. You've got that new big terminal called Quattro Terminal. So you've got two of the most efficient ports in, in Port Kembla, and you've got three of, three of Australia's largest millers all bidding for grain in Southern New South Wales. So they won't let they won't let the wheat price in Kembla. Well, our view is the wheat price in Kembla will not get to export parity. Yeah, right. Yeah. Not this year anyway. Awesome. Thank you, Richard. Now that's the uh, last question for this evening.
Um, I'll just encourage everyone to leave their uh, leave their comments in the survey, and that'll pop up after your webinar closes. And don't forget that next week we're going to be back online at Wednesday, same time, same place, uh, looking at uh, you know whether this grain that we're talking about tonight is going to uh, cost effectively feed or finish prime lambs over the summer and um, and early autumn uh, this year and next year. So. Richard, I might take this opportunity to thank you very much on behalf of MLA and and the uh, the wider audience. Not a problem. And uh, look, if you want any more information, there's plenty on our website. Um, so go and check it out, or just give us a call at the office anytime. Great, awesome. Well, thank you, Richard. Um, Thanks, David. Appreciate your contributions, and um, look forward to catch uh, crossing paths sometime in the future. So, uh, everyone tonight, thank you very much for joining, supporting the MLA uh, Sheep Productivity and Profitability Webinar Series. Looking forward to seeing you back online same time, same place next week and I hope you have a good evening. Cheers for now.